Okay, John. Thank you. Good morning. Thank you, Elizabeth, for the introduction. It is indeed a special privilege to be the Founders Lecture Committee Chair this year because I have the privilege of uh, introducing a, uh, well, a prodigal son, I suppose is probably the best way to put it. Pete, uh, Peter DeForest has been a member of the CAC since 1968, although I dare say a lot of the people in this room have probably only know him by his writings, his teaching, and uh, his name on various uh, memberships. We very rarely get a chance to bring him back to the left coast. Um, but his roots indeed are here. He uh, actually started at the Ventura County Crime Lab in 1960 and discovering the joys of criminalistics, uh, pursued a Bachelor of Science degree in criminalistics uh, at Cal at Berkeley in 1964 and completed his Doctor of Criminology degree there under Dr. Kirk in 1969. He um, has been with the uh, College of Criminal Justice, City University of New York, for 28 years. While there, he helped found the forensic science in, at the Bachelor of Science, Master of Science, and PhD programs, John Jay and City University. And uh, in addition to his university teaching and research, of course, he serves as a scientific consultant, an expert witness for police departments and investigators and attorneys across the country. He's the author or co-author of numerous articles, textbooks, and chapters in textbooks. And of course, he's a member of the Journal of Forensic Sciences editorial board. He's also been the chairman of the examination committee for ABC since its founding. And he uh, uh, lectures across the country and across the world, and in fact is a visiting professor at the University of Strathclyde in Glasgow, and uh, is presently, in fact, just here visiting us because he is at the moment uh, exchange professor at the National Police Staff College, Bramshill, England. So I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Peter DeForest. Thank you very much, John. It is indeed an honor to be invited to give this Founders Lecture, and it's a double honor because it's with the CAC. The CAC, in my view, is the premier association in criminalistics in the world. It really is the superb uh, group, pioneering group, and so forth. Uh, I think the honor of, of this is so profound that, uh, and the, the uh, association with CAC that had brought my father here, uh, who's in the front row, if he would stand up for a minute, uh, Dad. He just had his 81st birthday, and uh, he has never been to a presentation I've given before. He has, uh, we lost my mom about three years ago due to cancer, and uh, he's been very hard to get off his mountain home. Uh, he's here because uh, Marvin Sprine, who is the forensic investigator with the DA's office in Riverside County, uh, is his neighbor and uh, has been looking after him along with uh, his wife, Linda, as well, taking care of a number of things. So Marvin, if you'd stand up too, I'd appreciate that, okay? <laughs> and the other member of the triumvirate is uh, one I lied to 28 years ago when I told her that I was going to New York for two years. I would put it in my resume and uh, we'd come back to California. Well, she's a San Francisco girl, and I took her away from her family, and it's been a lot more than two years. So, Carol, if you'd stand up. Thank you very much. Now, 
When I first got the invitation here to give this lecture, of course, I was overwhelmed, uh, very honored, and I began to wonder, am I old enough, am I wise enough to do this kind of thing? And uh, I wrestled with this for a long time, but my ego was too great to allow me to turn it down. So I began writing on the, on the paper, and uh, I'm here. And as I reflected on the, this question over the last couple of weeks, I do realize I'm old enough. I have been having one hell of a problem with jet lag. I started out in England three weeks ago, and I just got acclimated to English time uh, just before we came to New York for two and a half days to come out here. And I don't know what time I'm on now, but I do know that I woke up at uh, three this morning, wide-eyed and bushy-tailed, and if you'd seen me last night when I walked in, I would look dead to the world. So uh, explain that one. I don't know. It's getting old, I guess. Let's take the next slide. We understand there's no remote here. So these are observations I have, personal observations. We've seen phenomenal growth in the field of criminalistics. We've seen great advances in technology. But we have to ask the question, has the field advanced? Has the core activity of our field advanced? Are we doing better science than we did 40 years ago? Are we contributing to our potential? And I would maintain we aren't, that we're far below our potential. Now, I'm sure I'm not alone in this. I'm sure that a lot of people in the room, perhaps most, share that my assessment of this. I'm probably carrying coals to Newcastle or preaching to the converted. But I think it's time that we do something about this. And so let's explore various ways in which we can address these problems and really have criminalistics come to its full fruition. And let's have a discussion of of possible solutions and, and agree upon these and take some action. Let's take the next slide. Okay, now I started out in this field, as John pointed out, in 1960. I was a chemistry major, but I was a reluctant chemistry major. I had loved chemistry from an early day, from maybe when I was uh, eight or 10 years old. And people gave me all kinds of apparatus. I had a, a bedroom table, a large table with ring stands and beakers and all that kind of stuff, plus the regular, you know, kids' chemistry sets and that kind of thing, microscope. But as I got to college, I began to look at careers in chemistry. And I guess I really hadn't thought about going on and getting a doctorate. And what I saw were people that were working in the Ventura uh, lemon juice plant there, lemon, whatever it was called, titrating and that kind of thing, looked pretty, uh, pretty mundane, and I began to really have serious reservations. But I was forced, finally, to declare a major, and so I declared chemistry. And fortuitously, about the same time, my professor came into the laboratory and he said, there's an opening at the sheriff's crime lab for a student working 20 hours a week. Well, I've been trying to find a job and uh, the idea of a lab job really sounded great. I knew nothing about the field, never heard of it before. I applied for the job and was given the job. And uh, as I got into it, I began to see that here was an application of chemistry or science more generally in which one could wrap one's mind around problems and deal with problem solving, and where every case was a different kind of problem to wrestle with and had these unique challenges. And I look back now, and I can't imagine having made better choices. There were a number of events like this that went along where various decisions were made, and I just can't imagine doing anything, anything more enjoyable than teaching criminalistics and consulting on cases and uh, lecturing and that kind of thing. So. Um, I, I really uh, look back to this moment with uh, great gratitude that it was so fortuitous that I discovered the field this way. Now I've put in the first line one-person labs. There were a lot of one-person labs in California. Uh, then they were called one-man laboratories. Um, if we look around the room here today, I think we see a welcome change. There are at least half the people in the laboratories now are women, and many lab directors are women. This is a uh, a real unalloyed um, advance. I do recall when I was teaching for Dr. Kirk, I think in my second year of uh, teaching fellow at, at Berkeley, that uh, Dorothy Northey had applied for a job in a laboratory which will remain nameless. And uh, there were reservations about the fact that she was a woman. And so I didn't have really great transportation then. I jumped in an old car I had. I think I'll show you a picture of that in a few minutes. And I went to the lab director and finally persuaded him with great effort to hire her. He then became very convinced 
that she was a superb criminalist and uh, the rest is history. Now she's retired and I'm still working, but I don't know where the, where the justice is there, but anyway. Okay, this laboratory was a converted shower room. It was smaller than this podium I'm on. It had a tile floor. It was hell on uh, glassware. One of my first jobs was washing glassware. We got a, a trustee from the jail to come in to wash the glassware. I, my reward was once I got through glassware, I could do casework. So uh, I'd go through that pretty quickly, and once in a while I'd slip and drop something. This is before the days of disposable labware, so uh, even the pipettes then had to be all washed very carefully. But it was small. We had very little in the way of equipment, except the human mind. And this is something I think we have to come back to and focus on is the scientific problem solving, which I'll probably uh, hit you with a number of times here and drive you crazy with. But in any case, this is the kind of stuff we had to work with. We did good work. We had pickle jars for our chambers for chromatography, for paper chromatography. TLC hadn't come into our lab at that point. I first discovered that when I went to Berkeley. We had Tupperware containers for, they weren't even that, they were just the throwaway refrigerator dish type things that we used for electrophoresis. And the fanciest thing in the laboratory was the Beckman DU. And if you recall the old DUs, they had a panel on the bottom that contained uh, umpteen uh, of these high voltage dry cell batteries that ran the various stages of the photomultiplier and uh, a, normally a six volt DC car battery to, for the main power for the unit. We were fortunate, we had a, one with a vacuum tube controlled power supply, but I use fortunate in quotes because the thing was always having problems. So, but this was our, our real, uh, real fancy instrument. Uh, I recall one day when the sheriff came in the laboratory and uh, asked the boss, he was showing some citizen around the laboratory, very, very proud of the, uh, of the lab. And he, of course, the DU was the center of attraction, so he showed him that. And then he looked over on the, on the uh, sill of the window above the lab bench and said, Elliot, what is that instrument there? And Elliot very quietly said, uh, Sheriff, that's a radio. <laughs> <laughs> so let's take the next slide. Uh, we, we did get a GC the, the first year I was there. We got a Beckman GC2, a pack column instrument, quarter uh, inch uh, coiled pack column instrument that uh, uh, did some pretty good work. Uh, I'm also very thankful to have had at least four mentors that I can point to in criminalistics that, were, that really, I think, shaped the way I look at this field. And the first of these was the guy that hired me in Ventura, Elliot Hensel. Elliot was a very humble, self-effacing, solid, bright scientist. And he taught me a lot. I really owe him a lot. In 1961, Elliot went overseas to set up laboratories around the world for USAID. And they hired uh, Tom Whelan from the LA Sheriff's Office to uh, head up the laboratory. And Tom was a very different kind of mentor than Elliot was. Tom made me question everything. I had been doing these things for over a year. And he would assign me the task of writing a paper, an actual paper on lab time, to explain the whole theory behind each of these things I was doing. And that was a, a very, very eye-opening experience. And I think, again, shaped the way I look at things. And of course, Paul Kirk. There's no um, need to really talk about that. There are many people in this room who uh, share the honor of having had him for a mentor. And I'll talk more about uh, Dr. Kirk uh, later on. But maybe none of you ever knew Hillard Reeves. Hillard was the director of the Richmond, California Police Department. He was a, again, a Berkeley grad. And again, a very humble, self-effacing individual. Hillard gave me the idea when I was working in his laboratory that I was teaching him things. Yeah, really, really a very humble guy, but really uh, learned a lot from him as well. And uh, he was Mr. Wizard in that department. Richmond PD, when they had a question about anything that looked like technology, they'd come to him. Very highly respected individual. Let's take the next slide. Now, you may recognize the criminalist sitting on my scooter here. This is my motor scooter that I totaled, <laughs> along with my face, uh, the same week that John Kennedy was killed. I was commuting to Hood Reeves' lab in Richmond, and some woman who did, couldn't see this, an object the size of a motor scooter made a left turn in front of me, and uh, we didn't, I guess, know enough then to wear helmets and that kind of thing, and I had uh, my face reworked. Um, 
three operations later, I look this way now. <laughs> but do uh, you recognize who's sitting on the scooter? Anybody recognize a current criminalist? Let's take the next slide. It's probably a little easier to recognize him, perhaps, in this one. But maybe the ravages of time have made that impossible as well. I don't know. That's Terry Coddington. Okay, next slide. And I re I've replaced the scooter then. I decided to have some protection around me. So what could I afford? So I went out and I looked around. I actually found a car for $150. It was only two years old and had 25,000 miles on it. Didn't sound possible, but I bought it. And I put another 25,000 on it before I began having problems with getting parts and so forth. But I loved this car. It was ugly as sin, but, uh, but I loved it. Uh, next slide. I'm showing my affection for the car here. Uh, next slide. Okay, now this is, I think, a fundamental problem that we have. And I think it's something that we've regressed on, we've slid back on. That we are not contributing to the investigation in the way we can. We have heard in the press, in the media, in the public uh, perception of science being used in investigations. It's still peripheral. It's not central to the process. It's not integrated with it, certainly. Let's take the next slide. And I think in many ways, the early California laboratories, although not ideal and, you know, it's always, you know, a, a tendency to look back on the good old days and so forth, but in many ways, these laboratories were better at doing this kind of thing than we are today. And I don't need to, I guess, really uh, dwell on any of these, these points here. Um, but I guess maybe one point I will emphasize is the idea of them being proactive and being called to scenes on a regular basis. And you'll see that one of my major themes here will be that, that the laboratory be proactive and that the crime scene itself is a scientific problem, one where we need to have teamwork with the investigators rather than being the, the peripheral uh, appendage. Now, if we go back to some old textbooks even, I mean, California, I've already indicated, was a leader in this area, but even in other parts of the country, there was more early involvement of forensic science or criminalistics, depending on what we called it at that time. And from a book over 50 years old now, you can find this kind of thing paraphrased in, in I guess, actually several of these textbooks, but these all imply early involvement, not waiting in a reactive mode, not waiting until this, the case is being prepared for trial. Let's take the next slide. Now, the reality today is that there's underfunding in most laboratories, even ones that look as though they're really well-funded. They really aren't. There are staffing problems. We don't have the staff to go out and do a number of crime scenes. We have fragmented jurisdictions and agencies. We don't have scientific oversight of the physical evidence aspects of cases. And I, you know, I could go through a whole litany of cases where the, this makes, those are prime examples of this kind of fragmentation. Uh, coordinating the investigation. There are problems with training of scientists, problems with training of investigators, and there are problems in the laboratory itself, once the case has gotten into the laboratory, of deciding what to do with it, how to assess the evidence in the totality of that case, and how to assign people to do the analysis of various parts of it. We have to look at a case from the point of view of the case, not just the evidence. And get focused on the evidence. Next slide, please. Now, I think that some of this early, and these are, again, personal observations here, and they aren't ironclad, but I think much of the early pioneering work of, of the CAC and the California people in criminalistics has been diluted over the years by a number of things. One has been the federal funding that took place in the 1970s that resulted in a lot of laboratory hiring and rapid expansion of laboratories and the building of satellite facilities and so forth. And along with this, we had people that had good bench experience that became administrators and were lost as mentors for people coming in. Now, there have been a lot of good criminalists that have, have been developed over the years under this kind of thing. I don't want to imply that at all, but it has not had the kind of uh, you know, batting average it would have had, I think, had not these events taken place. I think we've had a real marginalization of forensic science education, and I'll dwell on that a little bit later. Um, and I think that the DNA thing we've seen in the last 10 years or so has had another adverse influence. Certainly it's 
made, we've made tremendous strides in doing a number of things with DNA. I'm not putting down the DNA technology. It's, it's a very, very valuable technology. But it has had adverse impacts. Let's take the next slide, please. The forensic science laboratory or the criminalistics laboratory is not a clinical laboratory. It is not a react, should not be a reactive laboratory. In a clinical laboratory, you can have predefined problems. You can have a, a physician select from among a limited number of various kinds of tests that are done on the same kind of sample, the same way each time. It's a very, very different problem than the situation in criminalistics, where we need to have scientific assessment by the criminalists of the totality of the evidence. Let's take the next slide. Okay, now we won't dwell on this here, but the general agreement, even though I tend to use the forensic science and criminalistics interchangeably at various times, there's a general agreement, I think, that forensic science is a broader term than criminalistics. But criminalistics is certainly extremely broad. It's the broadest subcategory of forensic science by any uh, stretch of the imagination. And we should see it where we have the focus on the physical evidence from the crime scene to the laboratory, having a proactive role rather than a reactive role for the criminalist. Now here's a definition of criminalistics that was taken from one of the CAC a number of years ago that I particularly like. And I, we, there are a couple of things here that I think are worth emphasizing. I've talked about the evaluation, looking at the totality of the situation not just analyzing stuff, but looking at the thing and asking questions. And the recognition of evidence at the crime scene and the laboratory. These are things that criminalists need to be doing and doing more of. Let's take the next slide. Okay, we can break down the uh, activities uh, into various things like this, identification, individualization, which is unique to criminalistics, and reconstruction. Let's take the next slide and look at how these things can be divided up in terms of the sharing of the labors and so forth. The recognition can take place at the scene and in, in the laboratory. Certainly recognizing evidence at a crime scene is a much more difficult task than is commonly perceived. And in the laboratory, there needs to be emphasis on recognizing evidence, not simply taking a submission and doing what's requested of you with it, but looking at it and assessing the thing, and again, in the totality of the case, and seeing what things are there that have not been anticipated by the submitting agency. Particularly with trace evidence problems and garments and that kind of thing, where you've got really evidence on evidence, um, and where the way in which this is approached can be very critical. Identification, one of the more mundane things in a criminal six laboratory, but an important one. Individualization, again, this key activity that is important and done in the laboratory. But reconstruction should be at, done in the scene and in the laboratory, and it's very closely allied to recognition. And then evaluation and interpretation, very, very important. And these are done in the laboratory and in the courtroom. Let's take the next slide. Okay, then coming back to this theme I started with here about the early involvement of criminalistics in an investigation. We're doing a lot down here, okay? When we're talking about preparing a case for court, this is where we're putting our maximum effort. But there's a unrecognized potential or unrealized potential, certainly, at the investigative stages. We need to do more to convince ourselves and convince user agencies that we have something to offer at the crime scene. And this impacts the area of evidence recognition. One cannot simply walk into a crime scene and do the obvious and think that one has properly done that crime scene. Recognition of evidence is a very, very profoundly difficult intellectual process. Let's take the next slide. Now, you sometimes find an attitude in the part of laboratory scientists that they don't want to know anything about the case at all. They want to be in their ivory tower. They want the evidence to be submitted. They want to be told what they're going to do in terms of what, what they analyze, and they're going to report a result and keep clean hands. Now, there is certainly 
a risk here, and one has to be extremely vigilant to avoid having extra evidential influences impact one's scientific dispassion in doing these cases. But to simply shoot ourselves in the foot and say we're not going to look at the totality of a case, we don't want to know about the case, to remain pure is the wrong way to go about it. So we do have these, these problems here. But we can, come, we can come at those through good scientific integrity and through discussions and reminding ourselves of these things. At the crime scene, we must have this kind of input at the outset. The context of the evidence is extremely important. We need to see scientific problem solving. We need to view the case rather than the items of evidence. And I think we, we don't, don't do, as a whole, a good job with this. And then we, again, I don't want to give these short shrift here, but we do need to do things to offset that. In other words, the, the close involvement with the details of the case could, under those kinds of circumstances, adversely impact somebody's um, objectivity. But there are ways of dealing with that, and we want to emphasize that. Next slide, please. Okay, what makes the, the crime scene difficult? Well, one of the major contributing factors is that every case is different. Everyone needs to be looked at with a fresh approach. There are no two cases that are alike. This also makes it very challenging and interesting. You can wrap your mind around the problem and, and tr try to decide what kind of way you're going to proceed with this thing. A very challenging problem. Again, the context is critical. We can only get relevant answers if we're asking the right question. If we're asking the wrong question, we go ahead and do the analysis, what we've ended up with may be totally irrelevant or maybe peripheral. We need to invent the approach that we're going to use at that crime scene de novo. We need to have a unique approach, a tailor-made approach for each particular crime scene. These things, I can't emphasize enough, are very difficult, very challenging, but can be very satisfying when all the pieces come together through good scientific work and teamwork with the investigators. Then, once we've done the whole assessment, then we can talk about selecting various items from the scene. Remember now, a crime scene may contain thousands of items. The crime scene can be a record of the event that we're concerned with. But that event has only impacted some small portion of the items at that crime scene. So we have to be selective. We can't bring everything back to the laboratory. That would thwart the investigation. And we can't leave crucial bits of things behind. So we need to have informed selection of the evidence at the crime scene. Let's take the next slide. So here is our task. We must be methodical. We must be thorough. But we're dealing with non-routine problems. Unique situations each time. So we need flexibility. And this would seem to present a contradiction. How can we do this? Let's take the next slide. Okay, just kind of a various uh, combinations of permutations of, of relevance and irrelevance of evidence. And these are things to think about a little bit, but I won't go into it right now. But you might give this some thought. Next slide. The way that we need to do a crime scene and to be able to recognize the significant items from the insignificant or irrelevant items is by applying the scientific method. Now, this is a iteration of it that I have come up with over the years and lectures I've given that I find useful, but it's basically a formalization or a statement of what developed out of the <coughs> Renaissance science with uh, Copernicus and Galileo and so forth. That we need to be able to find a way of trying our best to keep human failings out of our conclusions. That's one, one way of stating that. So one of the first things we would do at a crime scene is simply gather data. This might be simply observations made with the hands in the pockets. Non-invasive, not unhurried data gathering. And then this overlaps with the process of cogitation, where we reflect on what we're observing. 
And then at some point, we begin to hypothesize what has taken place. Now, so far, this process is not unlike what people might do in everyday life. What makes this science is the reality check, the formalized testing of this thing against the data. It's a human tendency to identify with creations. And if you are going to a crime scene and you get a brilliant idea about what has taken place, unless you are very, very careful about it, you may have a very hard time seeing information and data that contradicts that hypothesis. So we need rigorous testing of the hypo hypothesis to avoid being led down the garden path. There are a number of, of investigations that have gone on in the past that I can think back on where the investigation has gone off on a tangent. And effort's been wasted because this kind of reality check wasn't part of the process. So we need this feedback loop. We need to test the hypothesis against the data. And this may be a number of times through the loop before we succeed. And it's sometimes helpful to have a partner of equal stature who's not afraid to tell you when you're wrong as part of this reality check. But we need to be very, very rigorous in this reality checking at the crime scene. And then finally, we would come up with a, a theory. Now, the theory might be something that might be developed for use in court uh, later on. But the hypothesis that's been refined and refined and so forth in this process of testing becomes our custom-made framework for use in designing the approach unique for that particular crime scene. Let's take the next slide. Now, there are other ways of looking at this, and I do recommend that criminalists become conversant with scientific philosophy. There's a lot of wisdom in some of the stuff that's been written in this area. Now, von Helmholtz came up with these first three steps. He called it a creative thinking process. Very famous scientist, but he didn't, I think, put this in the, the realm of the scientific method. He put it more in the realm of, of having uh, a good idea, gaining insight, and that kind of thing. Because he left out what Henri Poincaré added later on, and that is this reality check, the verification step. So if we look at this in, in its totality here, this is very much like the previous slide that I went through. We have this reality check to really verify that what we are coming up with is in fact supported by the data. It's very easy for us to get it backwards and let our human failings bend the data to put the hypothesis. And we've got to avoid that. Let's take another look at it. Next slide. Murray Gell-Mann, the guy that coined the term quark and proposed the whole theory of the quark, published a very interesting book recently that uh, my father and my brother got for me called The Quark and the Jaguar. And in some of this has some good philosophy of science in it that's well worth reading. And in that, he elaborates this kind of uh, process of how we deal with complexity. The book really deals with complexity. And I would maintain that there's really nothing that we really deal with in terms of problems in human life that are any more complex than a crime scene. And then you add on to that the time frame constraints and so forth in dealing with that and the, the idea that no crime scene is ever pristine and all these other kind of problems. A crime scene is a difficult undertaking. This would be the kind of thing I alluded to earlier about where we go off on the wrong, wrong track. It's maladaptive rather than adaptive. We don't have the reality check that's an integral part of it. I'll take the next slide. Okay, so just to kind of sum this up then, we do this repeated testing, and we end up with an increasingly, or a series of increasingly refined hypotheses. This then becomes our working hypothesis, working hypothesis for dealing with, thank you, that's very welcome, getting a dry tongue here. Happens when I testify too, so. <laughs> 
And then this leads for, for our structure for our investigation, this tailor-made framework for dealing with our investigation. Let's take the next slide. Okay, another way of looking at it, we're dealing with co complexity of assessing this massive stuff. You go into a crime scene, it's total nonsense when you first go into it. You have no clue what's going on, what's going to be important. You have to make order out of chaos. Get the signal out of the noise. Again, dealing with the situation where only some small fraction of the items there are likely to be relevant. And they won't be labeled. I'm the relevant one, you can ignore me. Okay? This is a very, very challenging kind of thing. The things that might appear most obvious might be of peripheral value. There are numerous cases we can point to where something totally unanticipated at the outset became the key bit of evidence. We need to do this kind of thing this, this way. We need to have informed selection. Next slide. Okay. Now we can divide the activities of the crime scene vertically here. I have separated collection and packaging of evidence from recognition and documentation. All are very important. They're critical. We've seen that, how important that is in cases we've seen recently. These are not trivial problems. Collection and packaging are not trivial. But in theory, I would maintain that they're addressable algorithmically, that you could actually write an algorithm that would allow you to program a computer to control the, the, the collection and packaging of evidence. There'd be a lot of branch points, decisions, and that kind of thing, but in theory, this could be done. The reason I bring that up is because I want to contrast it with the situation with recognition and documentation. And that is that, in my view, that cannot be done algorithmically. We need the human mind. We need teamwork at the crime scene. There are many examples in life, even with our, our, in our day and age of computers and technology and so forth, where we simply cannot match what the human mind does. Getting back to Murray Gell-Mann's complexity, there's nothing more complex in the universe than the human mind. Exceedingly complex. One example I use sometimes to try to drive home this point, and I hope I'm not running out of time here, but I'll keep, keep tabs on this. There was a NOVA program a number of years ago called Top Gun and Beyond. Anybody see that? Okay. I'm not sure it's a good analogy to use now, but... Uh, <laughs> but in any case, very, very briefly, the program asked the question, why put a pilot into a fighter plane? It makes the plane heavier. It slows it down. Requires all kinds of extra equipment to do it. You can build an airframe that could take many more G's than a man can. But it was the idea of having that human mind at that point, at that time, to make decisions a computer can't make. <coughs> and this is what I would maintain. We cannot do the crime scene that way. We, the crime scene is something that we cannot write a computer program for. It's challenging, it's demanding, and I would advocate the scientific method as being the way of dealing with this. Now, why documentation? Well, we can divide documentation into two kinds. Passive documentation, where one walks into the crime scene and begins videotaping and taking pictures with no clear idea of what is important and what's not important. Now, that should be done. But it shouldn't stop there. At some point, we need to get into the area of active documentation. After having gone through our scientific method and our process of recognizing evidence, then we actively document that evidence. And so because the documentation is predicated upon the recognition, it's included in that same column. Next slide, please. Too many laboratories or operate like this. They got a request, they respond to it, they analyze the evidence, they report the result. Now for some kinds of problems that can be appropriate. Doing a blood alcohol or perhaps a drug test, 
but it's not appropriate for other kinds of, of criminalistic evidence. We need to look at the problem or the scene, assess that, hypothesize, test, recognize the evidence, assess again, assign that, the evidence to various analysts, get the analyses, integrate, the, integrate and interpret the results and report them. A much more complex but much more informative process. Next slide, please. We need this kind of cooperation. Now, at the present time, I really doubt there are very, very many crime scene investigators who would appreciate the potential a criminalist offers at a crime scene. Now, most, of course, what I'm looking at are things from uh, outside of California, but I would think that was the case here uh, as well. And if you want to contradict me on that, go ahead. But I think we can do a lot more. We can do a lot more to demonstrate to investigators what we can offer. Each has to respect the other and know the limits and limitations. Have this teamwork approach. There will be overlap. We need overlap. The roles are complementary, but they must be defined. Again, the teamwork. Have a cooperative spirit rather than rivalry. Sometimes in, in jurisdictions I've observed, the local people want that scene to be their own scene. They don't want somebody else coming in and mucking around with it. So until we can demonstrate what we have to offer, this situation may not change very much. There are probably other ways of trying to change it, but I think the most effective one would be to demonstrate the value. Next slide, please. Another thing I'd like you to do, if you haven't already done these, is to read these papers. And if you want, I won't have you copy it down right now, I can get you the citations later on. But, uh, in the lecture I've written here, the written copy of this thing, I've gone into some of these and given some quotes from these papers. Dr. Kirk put a lot of thought into criminalistics, and he had some very, very advanced ideas about, um, about the field. And reading some of these things 30-odd years later, it seems kind of unfortunate that uh, we haven't developed in some of these directions that were suggested. Um, so I think, uh, again, we've, we've talked about my personal view of some of the problems that have led to perhaps the loss of focus here and the need to get back and recapture this essence of criminalistics. But uh, I think reading some of this stuff would be helpful as well and discussing these things amongst ourselves and talking about courses of action that might be taken. Next slide, please. Okay, now one of the things I, of course, I'm not unexpectedly uh, identified with is education. I think that there is a need for specialized education in criminalistics as long as we don't sacrifice the science in doing that. The re reality here is that most programs are very poorly supported. There's a great variation in quality among these programs. There is no common curriculum. In many of them, they have very little science. They call them forensic science. I have seen Institutions award Master of Science degrees to people who have a uh, degree in sociology, an undergraduate degree. Simply wrong. The need for this is not understood. Now, again, I don't want to imply that we can't have criminalists develop and good ones by other means. All I'm indicating is there are a number of reasons why I'm advocating this, but one, one of them uh, is certainly that I think we can, we can do it more efficiently. And I'll outline the, the next slide here. Let's uh, deal with that. First of all, having a professional curriculum is the hallmark of a profession. The fact we don't have one tells me that we're still developing. And it's been a very, very slow development. Now certainly, as I just said earlier, having this focused education is not the only route, particularly for dealing with a developing field. But I would like to see us move toward where we mature enough to where this becomes the hallmark of the profession, having a degree in the field. I think it's very valuable pragmatically from the point of view of selecting candidates for the profession to ensure common core knowledge and to provide a philosophy of how we deal with, with problems, 
foster problem solving skills. I find in our master's program where we get chemistry graduates primarily or bio graduates who make up the chemistry which required permission into our program that a lot of them don't know how to solve a problem. And they get thrown when they're given unknowns in the laboratory without a cookbook of how to deal, it, deal with it. So I, I think there, that we, we shouldn't always take the view that the pure science education has some virtue to it here. I think in terms of problem solving, some are, are pretty good programs and some aren't. But I think we need to, to uh, look at forensic science programs as incorporating this kind of problem solving and developing, fostering these kinds of skills. We also have a major value here, I think, in a forensic science education program, as long as it's a sound program, of now having a select group of individuals to complete the program who've demonstrated the ability, who've demonstrated interest and dedication to the field. Okay, let's go on. Next slide. Okay. This is uh, Dr. Kirk. You recognize this guy here? Chuck Morton. Chuck Morton. How'd you do that, boy, with his... Uh, Chuck, myself, and Dr. Kirk had been to a, uh, a, a fire tower. We did a controlled burning experiment back in 64. This was the same day that uh, I had uh, been asked by Dr. Kirk to be his uh, teaching assistant. And that's when I began my graduate career here. But uh, we just got totally covered with soot. And the secretary saw us when we came in and wanted to photograph us. You know those little tiny hairs on your ears? Things were all black and just, just covered with this stuff. Uh, I guess another evidence of my being old now is that those little tiny hairs are no longer tiny. They've become uh, <laughs> monsters. Okay, so you... Pardon? That's Calusa. That's 372 Calusa Avenue. Yep. Thank you, Ed. <laughs> All right. Let's move on then. I've got a, a shot of Chuck here with his uh, first true love, uh, my sister-in-law, or former sister-in-law, I should say. Um, but I thought in case you couldn't identify him with his makeup on, uh, We'd give, it, give you this, but anyway, let's take the next slide. Okay, now uh, back in 1965, after I'd been Kirk's TA for a year, we were asked to produce a television program on criminalistics, and uh, in order to get the uh, laboratory presentable, I became kind of a, a monger, and I required the lab to be cleaned up. We brought in ladders that were stolen from the uh, building and maintenance people and all kinds of stuff. And you know, Who's this guy here? Steve McJunkins, very good, okay. Next slide. And we were scrubbing and cleaning. That's uh, Darlene Gall, I don't know where she is now, but uh, next slide. Who's this guy here? John Murdoch. John Murdoch, yep, okay. Yep, and who's this over here? McJunkins again, right? Yep. Okay, so we got the lab clean. Next slide. Uh, Ken Moses and uh, Mary Lou Kelleher. I don't know where she is now, but anyway, a long time ago. She's a lawyer, one of those kind, huh? Yeah, all right. <laughs> Thank you. All right, there's Steve again, Ken Moses, uh, Pat, what's her name now? Yeah. Pat Niddle at that time. Zajac? Zajac, yeah, right, there we go. All right, now the, the, the crews arrived, they were filming us, they were using film then, not videotape, and uh, the, the production began. Next slide. Dr. Kirk uh, leading the class here. This is Tom Parazella, in case you recognize that <laughs> reflection. Uh, next slide. Okay, so then it, the day came when it was aired. We went to Chuck Morton's house. He, he had a TV, albeit black and white, which was the, the main thing then. And next slide. Just to prove that OJ wasn't the first time we had criminalistic on TV. Uh, here we have proof here that uh, it did exist 30 years ago. Uh, and I was the casting director in this thing, so I appointed myself in a lot of key roles where I was the, the instructor. Okay, next slide. And we recognize the back of this guy's head here. Uh, at that time, he was a lab director of the Kern County Laboratory, and when I brought him into the lab here, I made him my student. So that's uh, Jerry Chisholm, okay? Okay, more of the same kind of stuff. Let's go on. Okay. So we need to have integrated approaches. We need to integrate this stuff together. Integrate cr criminalistics into the process of investigation, recognizing that these scientific demands at the scene are, are considerable. We have these challenges from the scene through the laboratory, and I would maintain that many of the tasks, the scientific tasks at a crime scene, are as difficult, if not more difficult, than what you do in the laboratory. 
We need evidence recognition at the scene and the, in the lab. These are very, very demanding tasks scientifically, and too often they're relegated to technicians. Too often we have technicians in the laboratory analyzing evidence in a reactive manner uh, without really asking the right question. Next slide. Now, one of, the thing, one of the threats I see on the horizon here is the privatization of forensic science laboratories or criminalistics laboratories. And I think we need to think about this. We need to prepare ourselves to show why this would be a disaster. <coughs> there are some serious, subtle dangers in this, in this that I think we should become really aware of. We need to articulate the subtleties of this. The, what the under, overriding theme becomes, once we do this, of course, we have privatization, is cost, the almighty dollar. And instead of having a scientific decision made as to what will be done, it becomes a decision driven by bean counters. We can do this in a clinical laboratory or laboratories that do routine kind of work. We can predefine a problem, put a price tag on it, and it'll work fine. It works in clinical laboratories fine. We could do it for certain kinds of things we do in a forensic laboratory, such as perhaps the alcohols and the, some of the drug work. But even there, things are a little more complex. The samples aren't the same every time and that kind of thing. Trace evidence problems certainly aren't amenable to this kind of thing. And the crime scene problems aren't amenable. Are we prepared to really articulate to people making decisions what the problems that this would entail would actually be? I think we ought to think about this. Next slide. Look at some of this in terms of cost-driven selectivity. How are we going to price this? Price per case, type or category? Is that going to be a, a workable solution? Is that going to give us the logical, scientific assessment and, and uh, assignment of the evidence? Price by type of evidence item, a flat rate per case. You know a private laboratory is given a flat rate per, per case unless they're charging an awfully high rate, are going to find ways of doing what fits within the, um, the amount. Of course, I, in a sense, run a private operation on, as a, on a side, and I, I certainly wouldn't, wouldn't want to operate that way. I think the, the, the private uh, thing as the exclusive delivery of forensic science service, or exclusive deliverer of forensic science service would, would be a disaster. A flat rate per fiscal year, maybe we're re renegotiated, that kind of thing, but these things are, are problematic. How are we going to ensure scientific selection of the evidence if we have a privatized system? I'm not convinced it can be done. I'm, I have an open mind on this. I'm going to meet with some of the people with the Forensic Science Service who, in some sense, have already gone down this road, but uh, the Forensic Science Service in England. Um, again, we, this is the bottom line here. Each case must be looked at individually and assessed individually by the investigator and the scientist sitting down and looking at the totality of the problem. Next slide. Fragmentation of effort. Long history of this kind of thing in many cases. We can look at it and see how little bits of knowledge by different people were not disseminated. And we didn't have a single scientist looking at, at the t in total picture. I've got a number of these cases I've worked on, even some where I've come into the case months and years later and been the first one to see, the first scientist to see all the evidence. And all of a sudden it all comes together, even though it's been time where we've lost a lot of things and that kind of stuff. A lot of times I try to I attempt this and nothing works because it's just too late. But, but there are times when, because of this fragmentation of effort, fragmentation of focus and um, division here, that the totality of the case is not assessed and things that are critical in importance get missed. Okay. So again, the true potential of criminalistics is yet to be realized. It's not until we really uh, are able to demonstrate what it is we can do and get ourselves involved earlier in the process. Next slide, please. Okay, this is one I cooked up, uh, intracranial and intracranial information exchange. If we have a scientist and investigator working together at a, at a scene, there's not a lot of information that we can transmit between the two craniums. There's a lot going on in each, in each one. But unless there's a shared experience base within each of these craniums, sounds very mechanistic, doesn't it? 
we're not going to have the kind of communication. Th these data links here are just too narrow and too slow to be effective unless we have shared experiences, shared knowledge. So there's got to be overlap between our investigator and our scientist. Our investigator should understand a lot of what goes on in the laboratory. And the criminalist should understand crime scenes. And I would maintain that there are many criminalists today who wouldn't know what to do at a crime scene. And they would certainly support the opinion of investigators that they have no value. So we need, I think, as a profession, to address the crime scene more aggressively and show what can be done. The criminalist has this good scientific background to bring to the crime scene, but it takes the crime scene experience to develop that to where it can be a positive contribution at the crime scene. Next slide, please. Okay, again, there's more we can do before the case goes to court, before we're preparing the case for court. We can save a lot of investigative costs, reduce co court costs, reduce dependence on co-conspirators, on emotional witnesses. I mean, I'm, I don't know how many cases you've seen this in, but I've seen so many cases where there are witnesses that swear up and down something happened a certain way. And the physical evidence is absolutely clear that it couldn't have happened that way. I had one police shooting with six police officers who were observers, primarily. They were responding to uh, a gun going off, and uh, as they were responding, uh, one officer shot another officer. And each of these six officers described something different happening, none of which fit the physical evidence. So we've got to be able to show that we're, we've got something to offer here, that we have concrete data, concrete information to contribute to investigations. We can produce timely answers, not months down the road, ones that are timely for the investigation. There are a lot of situations that I've run into in my own casework where it really isn't a whodunit or a crime as such. Police shootings are one example where it becomes a very divisive issue in society. And the idea of getting a quick answer out there that has credibility would go a long way toward eliminating a lot of these kinds of uh, problems that uh, tear at the fabric of our society. So we should you know, enlarge our scope, I think, to things beyond simply the criminal and civil cases. We need to enhance the public's faith in the justice system. And some things of late, I think, haven't really done that. Uh, next slide. I'll let you read that for yourself. The, the whole bottom line here, asking the right question. Not trivial, but essential. Let's take the next slide. Okay, again, these same things in the scene and the laboratory, both important. Now, there, this is a real luxury, but it's one that you can insist on sometimes. To be able to hold the scene until you've gotten feedback. Because that's going to be helpful in formulating certain kinds of questions. Uh, again, assess the stuff first before you begin assigning things out. Recognition at the scene and uh, of trace on large items. A, a real key problem. I'm, you know, I've deliberately built in some redundancy here, but hopefully I'm not uh, boring you to death with it. Let's take the next slide. Okay. Teamwork approach again, the active documentation again, collection and packaging, we could relegate to a technician, but the investigator and the scientist have to work together with the active documentation stuff. In other words, th this is not a technician function. Sometimes people equate investigators as being technicians. To me, an investigator at a crime scene should be someone who's doing a lot of thinking and not following routine things and doing the same kind of thinking that's shared and cooperating with the criminalist and is not a technician doing routine work. I think too often we have this idea in our uh, structures and police departments and stuff that we have a evidence technician team that goes to a crime scene. If they're really technicians, I don't think they're performing the, the right function. If they become uh, investigators, then I think they're doing a good job. But I think they need then to work with the uh, forensic scientists or criminalists. Next slide. Again, this idea of scientific oversight. Somebody needs to sit above the entire case and look at all the physical evidence in that case and decide what's important, both at the beginning in assessing what will be done and at the end in interpreting it all. And I think in many laboratories, this doesn't exist. We see some of this coming in out of ASCLAD, I think, but it's more in terms of 
the focus being on quality control, which is important, don't get me wrong. But I think we need to look at how a case is approached and, and the problem solving thing and having a single scientist at least oversee the entire evidence picture. Again, I can go back to a number of cases I've worked on where it was only after I looked at the stuff months down the road that it all came together. People had been working in their own little uh, cubby holes, doing their own little thing, some things which didn't make any sense. Some evidence was actually compromised in the process. It wouldn't have been compromised had they understood the context. The context is critical. Next slide. Let me go back to that one just for, for a second. In the old days, this was the center of everything, the pathology. The body was the center of the case. We had a homicide case, the body was it. I think we're finally now convincing the, the community at large that it's the physical evidence and that the, the scene and the body and the lab d contribute to the physical evidence uh, analysis, assessment, and the whole thing. Next slide. Okay, here's our, what I would call a traditional model here. We have stuff going from the, the scene to the laboratory in kind of a one-way street. A little bit of information and a lot of evidence. Next slide. And this is what I think we should have, is more information, but more information going back to the crime scene. In other words, having timely answers coming from the laboratory and along with the evidence flow toward the laboratory. Now this may be a little bit of uh, pie in the sky in certain circumstances, but we can work toward it. Uh, next slide. There's, there's too much routine thinking on cases. It's often viewed as, uh, there are many laboratories I've seen where a, tech, a clerk, not even a technician, receives the evidence and decides who analyzes it. It's got blood, it goes to serology. Okay, so we need to have these assessments made by scientists and the assignment of what is done with it by scientists. We can't have the problems defined solely by the submitters. Discussion among submitters and scientists is appropriate, but not solely by the, the submitters. There's a lack of skilled investigators of the kind I'm talking about that are not just technicians. There's a lack of generalist scientists. Next slide, please. Now, California as a group takes a little heat over the idea of a generalist, and it's unfair. We have not articulated to the community at large what we really mean by this concept. A specialist clearly is somebody who has a detailed knowledge of a limited area. A generalist somebody who has broad knowledge in many areas, but with limited depth. Okay, so far so good. But there's no reason we can't have a specialist generalist. One who has a specialty, but has a generalist background as well. And this is what's needed most in forensic laboratories. You can have in-depth specialist knowledge in an area and still have this generalist knowledge. And of course, that's the, th the thesis uh, that the CAC, uh, or the legacy it left to the ABC, in requiring that that gen general exam be taken before the specialty exams. Next slide. Okay, here we take it to the absurd extreme here. The specialist has knowledge of everything about nothing, whereas the generalist has, has knowledge of nothing about everything. Okay, obviously, absurd extremes, and, but people tend to take these two terms and characterize them in this kind of polarized view. Take the next slide. Specialists can analyze the evidence. Generalists can assign the case, uh, assess it and assign it. But the specialist generalist can assess and work in a specialist area. And if we have laboratories set up with complementary specialist generalists, I think that this thing works pretty well. Are we running out of time here? Let's take the next slide unless somebody pulls me off the podium here. <laughs> Okay, several advantages of science to crime scene, but it's hypothetical in many regions because most uh, forensic scientists across the country would have no clue what to do at a crime scene. We need to have the experience, we need the teamwork. Next slide. Okay, the advances in technology. They're excellent tools, but that's what they are, they're tools. These allow problems to be defined by a layperson. But do we want that? Do we want the problem in a, in a case to be defined by a layperson. And I submit we don't. I submit that we need to see the totality of the case in the context of all the evidence and have an a, uh, informed selection of what's going to be most important. Among these submitters, it may create a false sense of mastery of the problem. They micromanage the case. I've seen many DAs running the case because they think they understood the physical evidence. Uh, 
they risk destruction of the evidence, and this has happened on numerous occasions, and they thwart case solutions. Next slide. Okay, this, this is the, the uh, there are three more left here. Uh, we've got to recognize the problems ourselves. We've got to, to uh, deal with this lack of appreciation of the user by the, the breadth of the service we can offer. We need to deal with a lack of appreciation of the scope by our own colleagues, particularly in other parts of the country. We need to deal with the constraints of reactive settings, you know, the employment setting and so forth. There is disparity between our potential and reality. Again, coming back to the same theme. We are not contributing what we could contribute. We cannot resign ourselves to the status quo. We need to stimulate thinking and debate. We need to develop standards. I think the NFPA 921 example, let's take the next slide where I've got that book here. This has been done, and John DeHaan has been one that's been uh, very much involved in this, of setting standards for the kind of qualifications people need to have to go to a fire scene in this case. Okay, we need to do more with that kind of thing. Next slide. We need to unfetter criminalistics, support academic criminalistics, and again, I'll come back to that same theme there. I won't spend any time with it now, but I think there's a, we should think about that a lot. I think it's, it's got a lot to recommend it, even though most of us didn't come from that kind of a background, it's important to consider the advantages that that, that imparts. We need to structure job descriptions to get the kind of people we want that can do problem solving. We need to support and broaden the, broaden the scope of certification, we need to earn the respect of the user agencies to show them what can be done if we're able to, to do it and to demonstrate the value to the larger community as well and to use forums like this to articulate the potentials of criminalistics to ourselves so we can then formulate uh, strategies for dealing with these kinds of problems. And with that, I thank you very much. If I can get unhooked here. <laughs> As I said uh, a brief hour ago, this was indeed a pleasure to uh, welcome Pete uh, to this forum. When I approached him, he did in fact express significant reservations about his capability to address this topic. But like most of the most memorable uh, Founders lectures we've enjoyed in the past, there are three key elements that Pete brought to this topic. A reminder what we were, what we've done, the conditions we've done it under, as well as a reminder of what we are today under various conditions. A statement about what we are, what we do, especially what we should be doing, and maybe a statement about where we've gone wrong, that context of our evidence is just as important, in fact, is probably more important than just getting the answer right to identifying what something is. And finally, most importantly, a challenge. What to do now, where we should go, what we should look at, both within and without, whether we are practitioners, managers, related professionals, or users of the criminalistic service, or educators. Some of us have to do all of those roles. And the challenges, I think, have been extremely well uh, put by uh, Dr. Peter DeForest. And I hope you'll join me in thanking him for a splendid presentation. <laughs> Peter, thank you very much. Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Well done. And with that, We'll turn the program over.